Well, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, great to see such a full room, and I'm certainly excited about this discussion. Uh, I, I'm Doreen Harris. I'm the president and CEO of the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA. We are New York's clean energy agency. And certainly, New York is Im implementing one of the most ambitious climate laws in the nation, and in fact, I would say the world um, as we speak. We have a scoping plan um, available for public comment that really looks at how New York specifically can achieve its climate objectives, notably an 85 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 economy-wide. And so when we think about how we get from here to there, we truly do see clean fuels as a critical part of our decarbonization strategy which is the topic of today's discussion, um, notably one specific clean fuel, and that is the fuel of hydrogen. And when we think about decarbonizing our economy, we really do think about the transportation sector as a critical piece of doing so. In fact, in New York State, transportation reflects and reflects about 30 percent of our greenhouse gas emissions statewide. And so we see a huge opportunity space with specifically vehicles, all types of vehicles. Today we may focus more on medium and heavy duty transport, but as a general matter, it's a huge wedge of our economy that we are needing to decarbonize. And as such, we take very seriously the advancement of resources and innovative technologies to help us do so. And that's really what we'll be talking about today with, with my fellow Fireside Chat participant. In fact, in March, we announced um, that NYSERDA would be leading an application to win a federal hydrogen hub um, focusing on the Northeast. And in fact, in March, we announced we have 40 private partners working with the states of New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and New Jersey to do just that. In fact, now we're up to 50 private partners um, helping us together to conceive of what we will view as a critical element of our broader strategy as a state. And so, as a result, um, we've been really expending a good bit of time with both our hydrogen strategy and specifically our analysis and awareness of this opportunity. And so exciting for me today is to be here, of course, as described with Andy Lund, who, um, whose team was really um, instrumental in bringing forth an opportunity for our team. Um, as you'll see on the screen, um, we had the opportunity to not only experience some Toyota vehicles directly, some Toyota hydrogen vehicles directly, but also to drive in both the Mirai and our, um, as you can see here, the um, the heavy-duty um, semi-truck, one, one of ten in the U.S. Um, here at our office just a couple of weeks ago. So I'm pleased, Andy, you've, you've joined me today. I really appreciate your team coming out to help us see and believe what we're heading toward. Um, with your experience in this market, I'd welcome just to kick off with a little bit of an overview of how Toyota and you, with almost three decades of work in this space, think about hydrogen and think about these vehicles as a solution for states like Yeah, thank you, Doreen. Um, certainly, uh, I've been working at Toyota now for 28 years. I'm a chief engineer. I've been developing vehicles. And um, as you see in the slide behind you, there's a Mirai sedan. And Toyota is mostly known for producing light-duty vehicles. Um, but what you also see is a heavy-duty Class 8 truck, uh, which was a collaboration between Toyota and Kenworth. And this all started when we launched the Mirai, and we were contacted by, you know, the California Air Resources Board, the Port of LA, and the question was, hey, does this hydrogen fuel cell technology work in heavy-duty space? And we said, well, let's see. So we made an alpha and a beta prototype, and then with Kenworth, 10 trucks. And we have basically shown that, yes, you can take a hydrogen fuel cell and power heavy-duty trucks, and now we see many projects uh, all over uh, with this type of technology. And at Toyota, you know, we take a portfolio approach. We know that the, the path to decarbonization requires us to act today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, and beyond. 
So for example, we produce, uh, we, we produce and sell hybrid vehicles, plug-in hybrid vehicles, um, working on battery electric vehicles, we've launched those, and now fuel cell electric vehicles. We feel a portfolio approach will be able to meet the challenges today and tomorrow as we uh, continue to develop hydrogen as well as other green sources of energy. So it's really great to be here with you, Doreen, and I really love what uh, New York is doing, getting, you know, getting into this and looking at the issues, and, and I know that we can solve them. Technically, we've been able to solve them. Now we just need to figure out how to create these opportunities. Well, it's great to have the opportunity to talk about this in detail, engineer to engineer, right? Yeah. Um, so we see a very unique value proposition that the Northeast offers with respect to the hydrogen resource. Governor Hochul has committed, like other states, um, to a, com a commitment for 2035 for light, uh, light duty and truck sales to all be zero emission vehicles, and by 2045, medium and heavy duty vehicles. And we see this in concert with the Climate Act in New York and the broader climate plans of the U.S. Northeast. Collectively, we are all relying significantly on electrification to achieve our objectives, but we know that there are sectors of our economy that, frankly, can't be decarbonized via electric um, solutions, or perhaps will help us to alleviate what may be increasing pressure on our grid. Just to give you a, a point of reference in New York State, we're looking at a, a, a future in New York where our electric load will double in the next couple of decades due to that expansion of electrification. And so when we think about technologies like those we're talking about today, they serve the dual purpose of not only reaching the objectives I just announced with respect to New York's goals, but further to serve, I think, as a very rational complement to that highly electrified future that many of us see together. And so, Andy, you've been here working in the space for almost three decades. I'm not quite there, but I'm getting there myself. <laughs> and I've been here long enough to see what I call the hydrogen, um, I don't know, uh, hydrogen, uh, it comes flying by. We all admire hydrogen every decade or so, and then it, 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 it passes, and the hydrogen buzz sort of subsides. I personally believe that we are at an inflection point and at a moment where that is not going to be the case here globally, really, and specifically in the Northeast as we pursue our strategies. So, Andy, what do you think? Do you think we're at that inflection point? And if so, um, why would you say so now? Yep, I, I really believe so. And just give you an example, over my 28 years at Toyota and even prior to that working as a supplier to Toyota, I, uh, I've seen a lot of trends, and maybe you've seen these trends. Do you remember when ABS brakes were first coming out? And people used to say, I don't need ABS brakes, I can brake better than ABS brakes. Well, no one says that today, right? The technology is adopted. Or crank windows. How many of you actually, you know, had a crank window to raise uh, your window? No one does that today because the technology of a power, which used to be a luxury feature, is now standard and actually lower cost than the crank window. That's what happens to technology. It's slowly being adopted. And when you get to the inflection point, and it's always based on the economies of scale that drive down cost and, and consumer demand then wants it more. At that inflection point, it takes off electrically. And we can see that now in zero emission technology. We've been supplying you know, hybrid and low emission, um, low carbon uh, technologies, but we are at that precipice where we can now get to truly zero emission technology. And all it takes is a few people to start that. You know, and, and Doreen, what Doreen is doing in New York, this is an example of how you can create that inflection point. Um, so is it, is it next year? Is it 10 years? Uh, certainly, uh, around the country, you know, we have the Department of Energy giving us a hydrogen shot uh, of one kilogram, uh, one dollar per kilogram. Th you know, that really sets a timeline as to when that inflection point might come. We have other states, we have New York, looking at adopting these technologies into a variety of services. Then that tells me that we are getting closer to that inflection point. Uh, and, and at Toyota, we have a 2050 challenge. Um, where we, you know, by 2050, every single one of our vehicles will be electrified in one way, shape, or form. And that's, uh, that's, a, that's where we think that we'll be, be beyond that inflection point by then. So 
we're going to get ready, and uh, certainly uh, we have the opportunity now to work together with NYSERDA and others to be able to actually make it happen, and it's really exciting. It is exciting. I think the other reason that I consider this to be a moment where we will not see the proverbial hydrogen comet pass us by is because of the, that very significant penetration that many states, notably in the U.S. Northeast, will see penetration of renewable assets at a scale that is simply unprecedented. So New York, just as an example, has an offshore wind goal, the largest in the nation, of nine gigawatts of offshore wind by 2035. I can see that easily doubling to achieve that level of electrification across our system that we envision. But what that creates for us, in addition to the other renewables we see across our region, hydroelectric power, wind and solar, on the land-based side, it creates an opportunity for production of green hydrogen in our region. And so when we think about our hub that we will be advancing, we really see production as a critical element and a critical value proposition that we offer, and I would say will continue to offer as we see that significant penetration um, of renewables across our region. But that really brings us to a related point, which is the fact that we don't take any options off the table. <laughs> when we are looking at a goal like that which New York is going to achieve, it means that we don't always know the technologies that we will utilize in 2040 and 2050 toward our goals, and further, that we need to be smart about continuing the advancement of multiple technologies to help achieve the objectives of our Climate Act. And so one trade-off I think that we hear a lot about, Andy, that I'd like you to weigh in on is, is this, I guess I would call it a dichotomy between battery electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles. As a general matter, we're, we're pursuing both. Um, how does Toyota think about that? And what are the sort of trade-offs that you think about with the two resources that we see ready to deploy in the market? It's a great question, Doreen, and, and I agree with you. Pursuing both is definitely the wise decision, both technically and also from a, just a business and strategy management, and this is why. When we look at electrifying vehicles, when I say electrifying vehicles, I'm counting both battery electric vehicles as well as fuel cell electric vehicles. They both operate on an electric drivetrain electric motor, uh, and the only difference is how are you storing the energy on board? And then storage of energy really depends on the medium or the, tech, the technology that's storing it. And in the case of electricity, I think we all know that electricity is a very good dynamic energy. That's why subway trains use electric motors, because you get 100% of your torque immediately. You don't need the RPM to ramp up. And so it gets very heavy objects going very quickly, and it's a very good dynamic energy. However, it's not so ideal to store. Uh, it, it, electricity dissipates in a battery over time, and the batteries have to be large and heavy. Uh, you can use a capacitor, but that's only for instantaneous storage and leveling of the, of the current. So from a standpoint of how do we store it, uh, it becomes a bigger challenge. And so if we're going to generate electricity either using green uh, wind power or uh, solar panels, and if we're going to use it right away, yeah, then, then you know, basically just let it flow, maybe have an instantaneous uh, uh, short-term battery to store it to take care of your you know, hourly or, or daily surges. I should say hourly surges throughout the day. But we live in America, and, and there's areas of the country where the sun always shines, like in Arizona, it seems like, and there's areas of the country where it doesn't shine that much or the wind doesn't always blow. So if we're really going to consider how to make America green using these technologies, we also have biogas and other ways to be green. Then we need to consider how are we going to build up storage when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing and, and then have that stored. And from that standpoint, hydrogen is inevitable to be a partner. So I don't view this as you have to choose one or the other. Right? It seems like we always get you know, we're always asked, which is going to prevail, which is going to prevail. I, 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 can't, I, I can't imagine, maybe it happened, maybe a hundred some years ago, did someone sit down and ask Henry Ford, tell me, which is going to be adopted, gasoline engines or diesel engines? Well, we know the answer today, both. 
both played a role in, in, in our mobility over the last 100 years. So as we go forward, I believe that both storage mechanisms will play a role. There are certain applications. If we look at a Class 8 truck, if you are operating in 150 miles per day or less, if you are delivering, you have a lot of downtime, uh, you are not going far, then a battery electric truck might do the job. If you are going longer distance, you know, 300 miles plus, and you are, don't have downtime where you want that truck, that asset, to operate 24 hours and create revenue, now you're going to want to be able to refuel very quickly. And that's where a 15-minute refuel is much faster than a several-hour uh, recharge. So I don't view them as competing at all. I view, view them as synergistic. Both from a supply standpoint, they're synergistic, and from a consumption standpoint. And, and if we provide the opportunities, the fleet operators uh, will be able to choose the technology that applies to them. And we see this also in the, in the light duty, in the retail. I, I believe if we have both options, people can choose um, which vehicle they would like in their garage. If, if we look at the, the average American garage today, you usually see two vehicles. One of them is a short distance vehicle. Maybe it's a sports car, maybe it's a small sedan that drives around town. Another one is usually the family travel vehicle. And maybe it's a minivan, maybe it's an SUV. And that one is expected to take that 12 hour drive or some families like to drive 24 hours nonstop. But the technology that will be able to do that, that around town commuting vehicle, a battery electric would work well. I'm not so sure if that works so well if you want to drive uh, 12 hours to go to some family destination and you don't really want to take long breaks. So both on the light duty side where the, where the retailer, uh, the consumer will choose individually, family by family, or on the commercial side where fleets will look at their operation and say, I need, I need a truck to do this route, I need a truck to do this route. And I think the technologies will be sorted out and both will be needed in the future. Thank you. I think this topic of synergy is one that we see very clearly um, as we advance our climate law, but broadly as we look at solutions to do so. Um, you know, this is fundamentally a change. It's a big change we're talking about in the way that people live and work. And, and really fundamentally, we've taken very seriously in New York State the fact that there's a lot, a lot of questions about how this can actually be achieved timely, cost effectively. Um, et cetera. And, and to that end, um, we have engaged significantly through a number of road mapping exercises across our Climate Act implementation, but notably with respect to hydrogen. Um, we have a, a full working group that is working with NYSERDA to really address these questions. There are significant questions about where we may apply hydrogen, the safety issues related to hydrogen, the perhaps emissions profile um, with respect to hydrogen combustion if we were to pursue um, that as a resource um, toward other aspects of our economy's decarbonization. All that to say, what we really need to rely on and what I believe to be true of so many of you in the room is facts. Facts and the science that can help us all be true, really, to not only the end game that we're solving for, but also the, the needs for development, for engagement, and ultimately for the market enhancements that we need to achieve these objectives. So um, a great example of our work is coming up very soon. I wanted to mention um, we are conducting another series of state of the science workshops at NYSERDA, which is focusing in this case on hydrogen, and notably not only an educational aspect for folks all over New York, but broadly the opportunity for experts to weigh in on these resources, the solutions, and frankly the challenges that we see as we advance these resources together. And I think, you know, with anything um, of a change of the magnitude that we are talking about, it is the case that we simply cannot do it alone. And that is why when we built this hydrogen hub, consortium that we are advancing together, it really needs necessarily to be the public working with the private sector effectively to advance solutions, to do what we do best together. And the partners that we've brought forward in New York, not only the state partners, but as I said, the 50 plus partners 
are needing to work together in a very important way, which is, I think, a few fundamentals. One is to create a market of scale and duration that can result in the investments by those of you and by the ARPA-E's of the world, but also the private sector to bring forth the solutions that we need um, to achieve our objectives. But to do so, there is, there is a little bit of a chicken and the egg issue. Um, we need to know where we're heading so that we can be investing in long-lived assets like infrastructure, specifically to Andy's point, um, to be ready for that future. And we also need to think about these solutions from the perspective of the benefits they will be bringing to the U.S. in the way of supply chain certainty, um, security as it is termed, and the like. We need to do that all together. So I think as we head toward the waning moments of our uh, fireside chat, Andy, I'd be interested to know, do you think I've got this right? How does Toyota think about the private sector's role compared to that of a state like New York or ARPA-E as another example? Uh, I, I think that's a good direction, Doreen, and I really applaud you for uh, leading, you know, New York in this important direction. And, and for all of you for attending today, these type of conferences, you know, tackling these challenges is really important. So I, I would hope that every one of you says, well, what can I do to make this inflection point come quicker? Maybe your company, your, your government, your organization can play that role, and I believe together we can make it happen. Um, we set out to just prove that it could technically be done. And we've done that. Now it's time to, okay, it's technically feasible, let's do it. And so I'm really happy to be here with you, Doreen, to, to get this started and, and really see this through. Well, it's not lost on me that New York is the 10th largest economy in the world. And I say that because when we set out to achieve a goal like that which we have, it's astonishing not only that we see the private market respond in the manner that we do, but that when you set the goalpost at an ambitious level like we have in the U.S. Northeast, that what we see in response is this transformation at a pace that perhaps we never could have imagined. Back to our topic of hydrogen, that is why we are, I think, at this inflection point in which we are going to see not only deployment on the private side, but commitments in the public sector that will realize this ambition um, over time in a way that is very rational and I would say necessary toward the achievement of our goals. So private, public is key, certainly. You can see that in our hub proposal that we are preparing now with our partners. We'd welcome more partners, frankly, um, to come forward to help us bring forth that best proposal for our region in advancing this resource as we see critically necessary uh, in, in achieving our goals, but also the broader transformation that we need across the U.S. and beyond. So Andy, thank you for joining me. Thank you, thank you to the ARPA-E team for hosting this fantastic conference. And New York is ready and open for business. We look forward to working with each of you as we advance this resource and others. So thank you. Thank you.